Chasing the fields, summer's on the way Sun is shining now, don't hide away Find the right wine, take a sip, drink down Take a longer walk out by the ocean Drift on, drift on Deep down, deep down What's up guys, welcome to Nurse Howie, it's been a while um, I'm just going to do a little bit of an update to see what's been going on Sorry it's been taking so long. I've done a lot more social media stuff on other accounts, but haven't really um, taken care of my YouTube viewers, all like two of you. <laughs> but I do want to bring out some knowledge out there to see what it's really like to become an RN. Um, basically, any kind of a healthcare student out there in the field today, modern way. Um, so yeah, um, other than my tattoo, steadily progressing. And um, I'm a little bit sweaty because I was outside trying to enjoy myself, do a little bit of self-care as much as I can anyway because I have a lot of work to do either with school or with um, um, other job obligations that I have to do a lot of my studying and um, my, my course uh, homework while I'm relaxing. So if you can call that relaxation, sure, <laughs> but at least I'm trying to take care of myself. Um, anyway, so I'm no longer working at the ICU that hired me originally. Um, I finished the orientation period and it just wasn't a fit for either of us. Um, the staff was kind of mean um, and the, well, they really didn't support new nurses. In fact, they were wondering all the time, like, um, why they hired more people. And it wasn't me per se that they were complaining about, but they was just, um, they were just not happy uh, being upended from their happy little space. Um, a lot of them were uh, experienced trauma and ICU nurses, but for some odd reason or another, which I can probably make guesses about, um, they, they were no longer working at acute hospitals and instead were working in um, less acute hospitals like LTACs and whatnot, such as this one. And, um, you know, they were, we were getting paid well, and uh, the work wasn't as... I would say laborious as being in a more acute hospital or an academic teaching hospital that has a higher level of trauma and higher level of care. But we did see patients that did have a lot of trauma and did have a lot of ICU stuff. I always saw patients that had at least one drip. They were always on a respirator, I'm sorry, uh, on a ventilator and usually had very high risk medication. They even had a lot of transplant. Um, um, transplant patients. Usually these are patients that were in the ICU for at least two weeks and had been moderately stabilized and so they were switched over to us and then we took care of the rest of their ICU care. They were still in an ICU setting. We had a small little ICU that was just everything was the same. Um, just a little bit less uh, severe, you know, like they still had a lot of patients that were uptended and had patients who had very very low blood pressure. Um, that they had to have at like a leave a fed drip and um, you know lots of stuff like that constant observation many alarms going off and I learned a lot um, but after a while they kept asking me to keep trying to um, orient um, they said I was being too humble if you can believe that and I was you know I guess I was, I was acting like a new grad student I was just very I was just latching on to each and every one of my preceptor's words. By the way, they always had a new preceptor for me like every day, which was very, very aggravating and very difficult because I had to relearn all the um, idiosyncratic things that each preceptor wanted me to know. And uh, it would conflict with some of my newer um, nursing school education uh, versus their old school ways. And so, and each instructor also had, or preceptor also had their own um, preferences so um, yeah and some preceptors were also too scared to let go of responsibility and let me learn on my own um, so they were very um, micro they were micromanaging a lot so it's very difficult to be a preceptor by the way you should really have training to do it you just can't be assigned to be a preceptor otherwise it's just gonna make everybody's job harder I think so anyway enough for the complaining um, I do own my own shortcomings. I wasn't that confident. Um, I always had a notebook and I would take me a little bit longer to get things done. I would never hang or, you know, or give meds um, out of window, um, but I would 
always try to evaluate things and analyze things right before doing it because it was an ICU. You don't want to mess it up, you know. I don't want to start a drip and then, you know, like let's say, I, you know, I wanted to make sure that all the other ports in the line uh, weren't being used for anything else, you know, like um, make sure that the, my lines like insulin or heparin didn't mix with any other medications or any other drips and so I would label everything. So it would take a little while and it would annoy some of the uh, more old school uh, preceptors but I really just want to make sure I didn't mess up. You know, I was there to learn but I was also there to be safe. Um, but it did take me a while. So um, I was a slow learner but it was only because I was very uh, not anxious, but more analytical and wanted to be more calculating with what I did. I mean, these were patients' lives. I think in the emergency room where their lives are on the line because they need to stabilize them first and foremost, that's a completely different pace. But in the ICU, you have to be very deliberate and cautious, and that's what I was trying to be. But I think that got misconstrued um, into something else uh, where they thought that I would, maybe I was too scared to do anything, but I was not. I didn't know how to relay that to the management because the management wouldn't watch me personally, but they would just get the um, the reviews of each preceptor or one or two preceptors that they favored, I think. And um, usually they would get the reviews from the preceptor during the beginning of our orientation rather than the end where I learned to be more comfortable. But that's neither here nor there. Um, at the end of the orientation period and after a few months, uh, quite a few months, they we all sat down and we talked about it, and they offered to keep me on, but to put me down like in step down or or med surge, which I didn't have a problem with, but um, it was pretty evident to me that the management was not out to support me. That they they did not have my back. Um, basically, they just mostly got the um, the the stories from. Um, nurses who were given favoritism and um, they did not take my perspective into account. Uh, for example, one specific incident was when um, a patient was brought in during a uh, shift report and this patient was, was completely, was in a code blue basically. And not basically, patient was in a code blue. And so I had to cut the report short. I had to make sure that the room was available. So I had to move another patient of mine out and then bring this one in, start the admission, and then still get what modicum report I could get from the other nurse. And then I would um, uh, check to make sure that the easier, more stable patient had at least their morning meds while I was stabilizing the new patient that was coming in, uh, hooking, hooking them up to the monitor, um, starting the levofed drip and um, uh, trying to make sure that the RRT was ready to go and that if I if they needed anything to let me know while they were hooking up the ventilator and then uh, we had to transfer them to a new special bed because the bed was more for um, we needed a bed that was more for an obese patient and then the doctor wanted to start an A-line. Um, even though the patient was obtunded, the patient started to become aroused. Um, but the doctor still wanted to start the A-line and the patient needed a blood um, infusion. So I called the blood infusion and then we were trying to figure it out through the EPIC system because this facility had just started to adopt EPIC. Luckily, I have a lot of training in EPIC, but their, the, use, the use of a third-party lab also needed different... Um, uh, paperwork so I needed to prepare different requisition forms and then I needed to get different stickers in order to be able to order a blood transfusion to come in for my patient on time so that she can get the blood on time so um, the doctor when the doctor wanted to start the, the A-line and there was a, we needed to call in the other nurse who was going to put in the PIC line for us and she was from a, a different facility as well so I had to arrange that and get consent from the patients next of kin um, during a work day when the when the patients and the patient's relatives did not really speak English. So it was a lot and um, so at the end of the day when I was called in for a management meeting they said that you know I'm sorry but you didn't you didn't stick around to learn how to put in an A-line and um, that was uh, your preceptor's main concern and I was like what? I know how to put in an A-line. I have multiple experience in the ICU from a large academic teaching hospital. And um, I told them so. 
you know? This time I finally started to put my foot down. I was like, look, I didn't need to be there. All the doctor needed was somebody to put pressure on the femoral artery while they put in the A-line. The procedure nurse was already there. They really didn't need another person. And so um, my preceptor had already volunteered to put her hand down. And while they were draping the sterile drapes on top of her, she was basically immobilized. I, on the other hand, took that opportunity instead of just staying to watch this whole encounter and to make it a teaching event for myself, I decided to put things in my hands and take care of the other two pa other patients. And so to take care of this patient, I had to make sure that the blood transfusion and the blood infusion equipment and um, blood was on its way. So that involves consents, of course, and a lot of requisitions and orders. And then at the same time, I also had to make sure that my other patient had their morning meds because he was on a time medication meds that involved having to really affect his metabolism. And instead of just waiting to just watch a procedure that I would never be able to do on my own anyway, um, I already, besides, I already knew how to start the equipment for an A-line. I just had to get the bag, make sure that it was a negative pressure, inflate it, make sure that it was up to 300 millimeter mercury, squeeze the bag, and then some had um, some would make sure to make sure that there was no air in the bag by putting, by uh, pre-spiking the bag, letting a little bit of the water out, and then spiking the bag back on, or I could just release it through the tube, inlet tube, hook it up to the monitor, and then make sure that the, um, that there was prime everything, make sure that there was no air in the bag, and that it was hooked up to the transducer and the transducer holder, and everything was all leveled, and then to make sure that the monitor was was zeroed also. So yeah, I knew how to do all that, you know, like, but there was other patients waiting. I decided not to make this a teaching opportunity because I decided that this was more important to take care of my patient first. So um, once I heard that, I think they were a little bit more impressed that I actually did something to, to, um, uh, to make myself look more competent. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't go around acting like I was an idiot. I was just very humble. I think they mistook that. I think they just mistook my hum my humility uh, for someone who was clueless, and I was not clueless. I decided to make a decision, and I decided that the patient was my main priority. I could always learn after the fact. But that wasn't what they perceived during um, when they interviewed my preceptor privately. And by the way, this preceptor was not a full-term uh, staff. She was actually a, uh, a per diem or a travel travel staff, so... Um, yeah, so they offered to put me down to another unit away from the ICU, and I declined. I thought that I did a bang-up job. A couple of the other preceptors said so. Um, more than a couple, actually, but um, their opinion wasn't taken into account. And so I decided that wasn't being uh, fully supported by this management, and so I would decline their offer to be moved to a different department um, that was also managed by the same people. So... That was an adult decision that I decided to make for myself. Um, they were a little bit flabbergasted, especially because I was able to just mouth off exactly what I would do with an arterial line. I thought I had no clue. But no, I did not lie on my resume. I have a decent amount of ICU experience coming straight out of nursing school. So, um, But every new facility is different. And so I treat every new facility as a new learning situation. You know, not everything I learned from one facility applies to all other facilities. So no, I decided to take my business and my my resource as a human being elsewhere. Um, and uh, I thank them for their time. So at first I was a little bit shocked um, <laughs> that I made that decision um, to resign and to go on to a different opportunity. Um, and I was a little angry. I was angry at the fact that um, the reviewers that said that, um, said that. She later apologized to me, by the way, when I told her the day after. She she did not mean for it to come out like that, but that's, again, that's how the managers perceived it. The nursing manager and the nursing educator perceived it, so that's out of my control. Um, so and then I came to terms with it, and um, I thought, well, I can be angry about it, or I can take this um, uh, last paycheck and use it for my next um, nursing opportunity and that's when I switched to travel nursing because a lot of the other nurses that was working with us were travel nurses and they were outstanding um, and then I had another a couple of paychecks you know that I had saved up so <laughs> it was great uh, it's been awesome 
I have been not lounging around the house, but really taking care of me, um, especially because I was worried. Another thing too, hey, nurse practitioner school, I'm still in nurse practitioner school um, about a year out uh, from graduating. And this was the scariest part for me because I have passed all my OSCEs in my assessment, as you can see from my other videos. But that also, oh man, that's a lot. Um, but also that I was looking for a mentor. So before, nurse, nurse practitioner schools weren't responsible for getting you a preceptor. You had to find your own preceptor to fulfill the around 500, 600 clinical hours that are needed for you to take the NP licensing exam. Um, some people say that PAs get at least a thousand hours requirements for their clinicals, but um, it's good, it's nice, it, you know, you should know that nurse practitioners are required to be RNs with a bachelor's degree prior to even applying to be, to go to nurse practitioner school. So um, we do have at least a thousand hours doing nurse, you know, during our clinicals, not only during as nurse BSN RN students, but also as working BSN RN students. We have to be working as an RN for at least a year. So that's where a lot of our clinical hours go to. That's why the clinical hours required to take the exam is only 500. It's because we have a lot of other hours that we've already completed, okay? Um, so, but I love PAs. I had a cousin that asked me if he should go to nursing school and become a nurse practitioner um, after getting his um, uh, degree in communications or public health or something. I said, no, don't. Skip all the skip all the hoops and just go straight to PA. You know, you might not get as much of an autonomy um, principal title um, that nurse practitioners have over PAs, but PAs don't have to jump through all the crap as nurses do um, when they're just trying to get their nursing license, their nursing degree, all that. Just cut through all that. Just become a PA. It's practically the same thing. You just be working in a hospital more often than not, or at least a clinic attached to a hospital, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's I would have gone the same route if I had the opportunity. Um, anyway, moving on. Uh, so after leaving, I decided to go into looking at travel nursing, and so it was a daunting task. It was not as easy as, as I thought because um, despite my, my teaching, uh, working in the ICU as an extern and then working in the ICU, you know, and before that being in the ICU during residency, during um, capstone in nursing school, you know, they, they took my latest experience into account and many employers thought that the, the um, level of acuity that I worked at in the ICU prior to applying to their travel agency and trying to get the contract from Kaiser or wherever kind of hospital, they saw my last experience, which was the only thing that was important to them and thought that I wasn't um, qualified enough. And so it was really hard getting some, some um, contracts. But I will talk about that in another video. Um, I'm going to wrap it up now because I got a friend that's going to pick me up and we're going to talk about my vacation, which I haven't had in about two years. <laughs> we're going to Greece. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll talk about travel nursing and then I'll talk about being an NP. And I found a fantastic new mentor. Again, um, usually nurse practitioner school didn't have to find you a preceptor and you had to get your own clinical hours, which was a nightmare. But thankfully, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, um, I put in a bill and he made sure that the nursing schools were required to be able to find you a preceptorship or a clinical. And my nurse practitioner school is the same school that gave me my BSN. And it is a brick and mortar school and it is difficult because I have to drive two hours to school at least once or twice a week and then do another two days, two 12 hour days of clinicals um, with my preceptor at her clinics and, um, and hospitals that she goes to and follow her around. Um, so it was a lot. It's a lot harder than being in a long distance uh, nurse practitioner school, but I get a lot of my questions answered by a real life professor. And I know you can do that online too, but there's really a, a, a something to be said about being able to be in a brick and mortar school. And I'll talk about that in another video as well. I'm not saying that the, the nurse practitioner students that I'm, I'm, sh I'm having clinicals with, uh, with this awesome um, NP mentor, is not are not smart. They're absolutely very smart, and they're responsible. and And I think their workload um, is a little bit higher because they have to do more papers. Um, uh, whereas I have 
that's more like undergrad for me, but whereas my school, I have to do more real life uh, exams where we have live patients that, are, that we hire and um, the school hires and then I'm under like camera and I'm being recorded and that's a lot of pressure. So that's where most of my pressure is. Their, their pressure is that they have to write like 30 page, like um, 30 page term papers and I'm kind of over that. I want more hands-on stuff. Um, so there's just different varieties of nurse practitioner schools that are online versus brick and mortar and I'll talk about that as well. And then I'll also talk about travel nursing and why it pays so much and how to make sure that you get the best deal, uh, at least from my perspective, because there's other travel nurses that probably can give you more tips, but I'm a brand new travel nurse. And I'll talk about travel nursing from my perspective of somebody who's completely new and just got thrown into it. And um, I'll talk about that later. All right, so hang on. Thanks a lot for letting me um, ramble on. And um, I will put more education videos as well uh, to pass the time. And I'll try to put in more casual videos. So videos like this one won't be so long. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot for hanging with me. And I will talk to you later. Bye from Nurse Howie. Subscribe, like, all that stuff. Bye.